Okay, so uh, we're looking at uh, Tennyson's Charge of the Light Brigade. And uh, that's a really interesting poem. Um, it's a 1954 narrative poem uh, that Tennyson wrote uh, for commemoration of the Battle of Balaclava, which happened during the Crimean War. Now, the Crimean War was between uh, the Russian Empire and the Ottoman Empire in an alliance with France, UK, as well as Sardinia, Piedmont. Now, this alliance was ultimately victorious, though, of course, at the time when Tennyson is writing it, um, that was obviously not known because the war happened from no, 1853 till about 1856, um, and this was written in 1854. So it's bang in the middle of the war. There is obviously no clarity about whether England is going to come out um, successful in this entire war, and yet there is a certain kind of um, you know uh, love for the nation that sort of shines through in this text. Now. Um, the poem per se uh, has a certain kind of energy to it, right? And that energy really comes from the fact that um, the meter that he uses gives you this kind of restless movement, uh, you know, the, the sense of the charge, right? Because it is the charge of the Light Brigade. Now, to understand a bit about what the charge of the Light Brigade really was about, uh, one has to sort of go back into the battle itself. Now, this is a decisive event in military history, but not necessarily because of how positively it impacted the battle <clears throat> or the Crimean War, but more in terms of the fact that this was a foolhardy mission. It ended in massive loss of life. And a great number of people who did not die also were heavily injured, or right, wounded. And so as a result, this became one of those central campaigns that really highlighted the mismanagement of military intelligence. So it became one of those events that you kind of, I mean, even now, military scholars look back at the charge of the Light Brigade to see how it could have been prevented and why it's so problematic and why, you know, um, intelligence in the military network is so important and communication. So there was a lot of miscommunication, the wrong um, orders were translated to the soldiers and who then ultimately went to their death. So there were actually 670 soldiers as part of the charge of the, of the Light Brigade. Uh, but I think in the early news reports, it's at 600, and that sounds like a cool round number, so that's what um, Tennyson uses in his poem as well. So about 110 of them died, and 160 were wounded. And that's a massive number, and we're really looking at a heavy loss of life, right? And yet the poem comes to us from a very different kind of a space. So we should actually just read the text because that would give us some idea of what Tennyson is really trying to convey in his poem, right, before we sort of go any further. Uh, half a league, half a league, half a league onward, all in the valley of death, rode the 600, forward the light brigade, charge for the guns, he said, into the valley of death, rode the 600, forward the light brigade, was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew someone had blundered. Theirs not to make reply. Theirs not to reason why. Theirs but to do and die. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, cannon in front of them, volleyed and thundered, stormed out with shot and shell. Boldly they rode and well. Into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell rode the 600. Flashed all their sabres bare, flashed as they turned in air, sabring the gunners there, charging an army while all the world wondered. Plunged in the battery smoke, right through the line they broke, 
Cossack and Russian reeled from the saber stroke, shattered and sundered. Then they rode back, but not, not the 600. Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, cannon behind them, volleyed and thundered, stormed out with shot and shell, while horse and hero fell. They that had fought so well came through the jaws of death, back from the mouth of hell, all that was left of them, left of 600. Where can their glory fade? Oh, the wild charge they made! All the world wondered. Honour the charge they made. Honour the Light Brigade. Noble 600. Now, there is a certain kind of verb and energy to it. If anything, the restless movement, the urgency, uh, the sense that, you know, they're rushing into something, uh, which is probably foolhardy, comes through from the energy of Tennyson's poetry, right? And it is something that fits what the text is really trying to convey. But there are other things that we also sort of notice when we look at a piece like this, because for one, charge of the Light Brigade uh, as part of the Crimean War become significant for another reason. So Crimean War is considered one of the first modern wars. And this is because a lot of the technology used in this war was unlike, which had been used up to this point of time. It was also in that sense, um, one of the first wars to actually be heavily documented in media. So the newspaper reported it heavily. Um, it's the first time that journalists were sent to the war front, right? And they were in that sense recording the battle from the battle. So the earliest uh, war correspondence actually come from the Crimean War itself. Now, prior to the Crimean War, a lot of the illustrations that accompanied um, a war report in the newspaper were done by artists. So there were, in many ways, the artist's representation of the war, right? Uh, but after they sort of got these more realistic images from these correspondents, these special correspondents who were at the war front, the public uh, taste for this kind of reporting changed. They didn't want an artistic representation, they wanted as real, as gritty as it possibly could be. So that is one of the things that changed. The other thing that happened with the Crimean War is that people had opinions on the war. They were getting information almost at time with most other people. Right. Of course, the military may have heard of it a little earlier, but a lot of the report was coming on time for the general public. And so that influenced public sentiment towards the war. So when the charge of the Light Brigade happened and so many people died and so many people were injured, that impacted how the public looked at this particular battle, the Battle of Balaclava, and specifically at this charge. And they did not approve of what the military commands did because for them it was just like, you did not do your job and so, so many people died, right? Now, Tennyson acknowledges that clearly that miscommunication was a problem, but it's about how he acknowledges it, right? And to backtrack a bit to understand exactly why does Tennyson use a specific kind of language, one must remember the fact that Tennyson is poet laureate. Now, if he's poet laureate, he's basically appointed by the British Crown to speak about Britain. So he can't particularly present a viewpoint that is at variance with the official take and, and in the sense that you can criticize individuals who made mistakes but you cannot criticize the larger uh, country the larger kingdom because that would destabilize the land right so um, Tennyson's perspective that shines through the poem is one where there is a glorification of what the soldiers have done there is some 
some criticism of what the command has done. But more than anything else, it's like, let's acknowledge how wonderful they were. Let's acknowledge how, you know, terrible their fate is, but look at how greatly they did it in the most brave and, you know, um, uh, soldierly way possible. And it is true because even the accounts, military accounts of the charge do tell us that despite realizing that they had probably walked into the worst situation, the soldiers plodded ahead. And in fact, seeing the soldiers rushing towards them freaked out even the, uh, the Russians on the other side because it was just like these guys are just advancing despite the fact that it is all loaded against them. There are guns and they're just flashing sabers and going in anyways. So that did frighten them. So, and it, in fact, it did create a certain sense of panic in, uh, in, in the battlefield itself. But and, and of course, the British soldier in this case does come across as a brave, patriotic figure. But one does not, in that sense, use that to justify what um, the soldiers finally had to go through, right? And that is the ultimate problem with a text like Charge of the Light Brigade. Like, it is a brilliant piece. And there is a certain kind of musicality to it. There's a certain kind of rhythm to it that is so stunning to listen to. And you are, in that sense, caught in the emotion of the piece. But one also needs to acknowledge the fact that it is problematic to glorify this because what ends up happening is that when you glorify the soldier's sacrifice, when you say that, you know, it is the soldier's duty to obey, to follow through, even if it's a stupid decision because that is what a soldier is supposed to do, then you are sort of in many ways pitting them up for further um destruction. You know, you are also putting them in a position that is uncomfortable to be in. And that's dangerous, right? Because you're also saying that they must sacrifice themselves for the greater good, for, you know, the gl greater glory of the land. And that's a very problematic sentiment because what that does is that it pushes the soldier to continue to do something that is actually problematic and gives them no space for redressal, which is dangerous. And this is unfortunately a viewpoint which should have gotten challenged during the Crimean War, but went unchallenged till like the First World War, which turned out to be less war, less honor, more massacre, more destruction, and definitely a lot of trauma, right? But it's something that could have ideally been acknowledged in the Crimean War, but the Crimean War then goes back to the same narrative of war that we've had up to this point in time, which is that war is glorious, war is, you know, epic, and there are heroes on the battlefield, which is the language of the Iliad or uh, the Mahabharata. And while it is a language that was popular in a certain time period, it is not necessarily a positive viewpoint because none of these texts ever acknowledge what happens to the foot soldier, right? They always talk about the grand heroes, and so the grand heroes can emerge, but the foot soldier that gets mowed down is never really spoken about, and that's a problem. So Tennyson obviously is speaking from a non-soldierly perspective, right? He's talking from the perspective of the person, you know, the, the lay, uh, you know, the civilian, sorry, uh, sitting back at home, reading a newspaper report and being like, oh my God, this is terrible, but you know what? Wonderful. Like, you know, this is what the soldier should do. As opposed to a soldier reading it and being like, oh my God, this is frightening. Like, what did they really go through, right? And, and this is a viewpoint that, like I said, was only challenged with the First World War when you had a lot of the war poets like Wilfred Owen and Siegfried Sassoon who were just like, war is messy, it's disgusting, violent, and there is nothing glorious about it. And that's a viewpoint that they presented because they were poets who fought as opposed to Tennyson and everybody else who were in that sense talking from 
within the safe confines of their homes, right? And of course, there is a certain kind of, I mean, I wouldn't go so far as to say propaganda, but there is this sense that you do not want to criticize the land because if ugly, um, uh, negative sentiment pertaining to the war spreads in the country, then there is a lot that could go wrong, right? And it's an, it, it creates unstable political space that you do want. So you don't acknowledge it and instead you highlight something else. So you talk about the noble charge, you talk about the noble 600, and you reduce the military miscommunication and mismanagement to a blunder, right? Like, which is what comes in second stanza. Uh, forward the light brigade. Was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew someone had plundered. I mean, plunder? The death of 110 people and the wounding of 160 people and the decision to send 670 people to sure death is not a blunder. There is something else. And it is, in that sense, a severe understatement of what actually happened, right? It is understandable from a military point of view, from a political point of view, why that needs to be done. But it's not appropriate. And see, we as modern readers do not have to look at it that way. We don't have to look at it as, oh, well, you know, it's understandable and it's a good thing. We can afford to, from this removed perspective, critique it as one of the many other ways where the soldier gets undermined and yet also propped up as a kind of flag of perfect behavior, you know, which um, is reductive. And that's something that doesn't really end up getting acknowledged, right? And so that is an aspect of it that we really need to consider. Now, another thing just to point out before we just sort of temporarily wrap up, um, is the idea of um, the valley of death, you know, because another thing you do notice is that uh, the line, all in a valley of death, row the 600, forward the light brigade, charge the guns, you said, into the valley of death, row the 600, and this line, by the way, repeats in, in the second stanza, which is again, into the valley of death, row the 600, and the third stanza becomes into the mouth of hell, row the 600. You know, and the thing is that the term Valley of Death is something that comes from the Bible, it's from the Psalm 23. And so, again, using a reference from biblical uh, text is another way to sort of destabilize the critique, right? Because uh, religion tells us that it is good to suffer. Suffering is good. It haunts us. It gives us personality. We are better for our sufferings. We are purified by our sufferings. So, um, if the original, the 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 psalm itself talks about that, you know, they will go into the valley of death uh, with no fear because you know they know that you know God is with them. Then the idea is that the soldier can walk freely into death because they know they're doing. The, they're doing something for the greater good. And so this is a justification of it all. Which <laughs> is a bit of an issue. Anyways, uh, with this we just take a temporary pause and we will come back to the next segment uh, continuing the argument on uh, Charge of the Light Brigade or rather the analysis of Charge of the Light Brigade.